Hi, I'm Kate O'Donnell, and I'm a fellow with the Odd Salon San Francisco chapter. Now tonight, I tell you a tale of patriarchy, prejudice, and perseverance, of stigma and solidarity, of obstacles and overcoming, and of the best retort to that annoying friend who's always talking about how they were born in the wrong era, untreatable syphilis. Described once by German humanist and syphilis sufferer Yusuf Grunpeck as, quote, so cruel, so distressing, so appalling that until now, nothing more terrible or disgusting has ever been known on this earth. Aren't you excited to hear about this? <laughs> I promise it gets better. Mostly because of the compassion of this guy, Mr. Crumpton, who had found a beautiful, unprecedented organization, the likes of which had never been seen, and the scene of which had never been liked. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Our tale begins in 18th, 19th century London, depending on who you ask. Despite the heterosexist prudishness often rightly associated with the era, people still had sex. A lot of sex. And while it's impossible to know the exact rate of syphilis at the time, basically, if you were sexually active between 1495 and the invention of penicillin in 1928, there's a good likelihood that you were hanging out with this little bugger, untreatable syphilis. Now, you'd be in great company with a lot of people who were alive in those times. Gauguin, Baudelaire, Toulouse-Lautrec, Manet, Tolstoy, Nietzsche, Lenin, Al Capone, Hitler, Mussolini, Schubert, Beethoven, Lincoln, yeah, Lincoln. Maybe Winston Churchill's dad because of literally the worst prank ever. And millions of others, including a hell of a lot of people who didn't make it into the history books because they were not white men. So many that we have no idea and we'll never have any idea because the history of syphilis is a history of stigma and blame. It's very names ascribed blame. Not the word syphilis. That actually comes from a pretty effed up poem in which a shepherd named Syphilis calls out the sun god for killing his entire flock and then is cursed with this horrible disease as a thanks for speaking truth to power. But it's other names. Like, seriously, history pro tip cheat sheet. If you want to know who was enemies with whom, just find out the colloquial name for syphilis. In France, it was the Neapolitan disease. In Naples, it was the French disease. In today's Italy, Germany, UK, it was also the French disease. In Russia, it was the Polish disease. In Poland, the German disease. The Danes, Portuguese, and North Africans called it the Spanish Castilian disease. The Turks called it the Christian disease. In Northern India, it was the Hindus' fault, according to the Muslims, and the Muslims' fault, according to the Hindus, but at least everyone could agree that it was the European disease. Now, when it comes to the blame game, the name was just the tip of the iceberg. For many, the disease was public and unforgiving. While many fortunate carriers remained asymptomatic, many more suffered from painful, very visible sores, which, along with smallpox, is actually one of the reasons that pancake makeup and beauty marks became so fashionable at court. Worse, 15 to 30 percent of untreated cases had horrifying issues, including general paralysis of the insane and noselessness. One thing syphilis can do is degrade the nasal bone structure, you can actually see it here in the skull on the left. And in 18th, 19th century London, it's not like there's much you could do about it. Which brings us back to Mr. Crumpton. For one reason or another, he was fascinated with the noseless of London and decided to seek them out. From what we know, he spent part of the early 1700s or late 1800s, depending on who you ask, but for this purpose, we're gonna go with the former. Strolling around town and basically just rolling up on people missing their noses and telling them that if they would just meet him at the Dog Tavern on Drury Lane at a certain day and time, he'd tell them a secret. Not weird at all. How many people did he find? Well, probably plenty, because... Okay, hold on, Mr. Crumpton. We'll get back to you in just a second. See, in 18th century London, it's not like there's much you could do about not having a nose. It was syphilis that birthed the first rhinoplasty, but the best thing they could do at the time was this gruesome skin graft from your arm requiring you to be in a cast like this for 40 days, all of which could be lost should you succumb to a violent bout of sneezing. The other option was the prosthesis, like this one made by the Royal College of Surgeons in Victoria era London, for a woman who contracted syphilis from her dirtbag husband after he cheated on her and told her she wasn't pretty enough anymore and made her wear this honkin' thing around all day. Hmm. That's not really a picture of her husband, but like, I felt like it was accurate enough. 
In addition to being a cumbersome metal device you had to wear on your face, prostheses were very expensive, which means if you lost your nose to syphilis, you just didn't have a nose. So our Mr. Crumpton probably spoke to a lot of folks, and like I just can't imagine how that conversation would go. Because we know Mr. Crumpton was well-bred. So there you are, suffering from syphilis, missing a nose, when some gentleman comes up to you, and even if it's like a slightly weird invitation, he wants to talk. And the other reason why that would be so unusual is that these people's disfigurement was not the only reason they were outcasts. To add the worst insult to the worst injury, if you lost your nose to syphilis, not only would you have to suffer the day-to-day -day of being treated like a monster, your quote-unquote monstrosity is something you deserved. Because that was, is, let's be real, the extra fun in having a sexually transmitted infection. You were a sinner, and this was your punishment. And yes, this is a woodcut of Jesus punishing sinners with evil syphilis rays. Charming. I know. And because morality has always been used as a tool to condemn what the ruling class fears, not only were you a sinner if you had it, a woman was unpure if her lady brain even knew about the existence of the disease. Which is why, if you were among those approached by Mr. Crumpton, it must have seemed so particularly odd for a well-heeled gentleman to treat you like a person. So, who was this guy with a secret for the noseless of London? Well, we know he was either a resident or frequenter of Covent Garden, an area particularly known at the time for its sex work. Now, I have a long rant that goes here about feminism and sex workers and how it's always women's fault. In fact, did you know that our vaginas can actually be agents of Hitler? Hashtag no medicine for regret. Because, hey, we may look like goddesses, but our private parts are actually demonic agents of man-eating death. Which is why so many sex workers were condemned to lock hospitals and workhouses if they were suspected of having an STI in the 1800s. And there's so, so, so much more here and we don't have time for it, but dear God, if you're jonesing for a feminist rant, I am your gal. <clears throat> Back to Mr. Crofton. We don't know a lot about him. We do know that he did have a nose and though there were no visible symptoms, it's pretty likely he was suffering from some sort of disease. Don't know much else, though. We do know that that was not his name. Crumpton was an alias. And we also know that that was not his face. There's really very little known about this guy. This is a picture of a random dude I found on the internet. But, like, he looks really nice, right? So what we do know comes from Ned Ward, pub owner and publisher of The London Spy, and his 1709 Guide to London Clubs. Now, on Vogue at the time were gentlemen's clubs, which I always think of as looking something like this and really wished looked like this, and were probably actually more like this, where people named Mr. Dumpley read boring papers. That said, the club about to form was anything but boring. See, that was the secret Mr. Crumpton was talking about. He was forming a club, one where, in the words of Ned Ward, people could, quote, show their scandalous wizards in one noseless society. When the appointed day of secret telling time came, Crumpton put in an order for a feast at the Dog Tavern and warned the staff not to be too surprised at the appearance of his guests. At the appointed hour, the guests arrived and were ushered upstairs from the bar to their own private gathering area. Now, according to this account, none of the attendees had any idea what secret they were coming for and were really surprised to find out that the secret was joining a group of people who looked like themselves. As Ned writes, quote, as the number increased, the surprise grew the greater among all that were present, who stared at one another with such unaccustomed bashfulness and confused oddness, as if every sinner beheld their own iniquities in the faces of their companions. Now let's just pause for a second to imagine what walking into a welcome community filled with people who looked like them must have been like for these folks. Like the street they'd just come from was filled with people who treated them like monsters, to this day, those without a nose are depicted as demons. Perhaps there's an association with snakes demonized in Christian theology, I don't know. But I think surgeon Johann Friedrich Dieffenbach captured it accurately in an 1890 surgical text when he wrote, quote, A blind man arouses pity, but a person without a nose creates repulsion and horror. And what's more, the world is still used to regarding this unfortunate disfigurement as a punishment, 
The unfortunate man who has lost his nose enjoys no pity at all, least of all from bigots, homeopaths, and hypocrites. Stepping in from the cruel outside world, all of a sudden these folks were not only not demonized, they were celebrated. Their faces transformed from marks of stigma to the commonality shared between a community. And in the safety of this community, humor blossomed. At one point, the cook sent down two pigs ordered for the feast and had just had cut off the snouts. Crumpton was not pleased. But everyone else began joking about it. As Ned wrote, quote, And then they began to jest and be merry with one another's iniquities as if their sufferings were their glory. And thus was born the No Nose Club. Yes, its actual name. As far as we know, after this first auspicious gathering, they decided to meet monthly. And today we're pretty accustomed to group meetings from those suffering from the same disease, from alcoholism to AIDS, but like, let us not forget how revolutionary that idea is. Especially with an STI like syphilis enshrouded by society with shame. Something that's your fault for having because you're a sinner. Something respectable ladies can't even know exists. To this day, syphilis is still incredibly stigmatized. I mean, in a sense, it's that stigma preventing folks from being tested that is one of the reasons it's even still around the extent that it is. But by 1709, at least one group of people got it right. We think. Was the No-No's Club real? For the sake of historical accuracy, it's worth noting a couple things here. A. There was a very similar version of the story reported in multiple papers about a hundred years later. Either someone read the 1709 account, was inspired to do the same thing, and assumed the very similar name Mr. Crampton, or it was simply old news recycled. B. Ned Ward, writer of the 1709 account, was published in a variety of genres, but one of the ones he was well known for was satire. C. That said, multiple well-respected historians have taken Ned at his word and published this account of the No Nose Club. Either way, there is no debate that the 1700s saw the origin of certain types of medical support groups. So I'm going to leave the length of Mr. Crumpton's nose up to you. To finish this account, the final meeting of this iteration of the No Nose Club was sadly at Mr. Crumpton's funeral, less than a year after the first meeting, upon which members of the club delivered a eulogy that begins, quote, Mourn all ye no-nosed, the fairest face. The power of solidarity and the acceptance of people as fellow human beings cannot be overstated. It even goes beyond the interpersonal, like who wants to support research for diseases that only monsters and sinners get? Obviously, no one should ever be othered. No one should ever have to wear a heavy, expensive prosthesis on their face in order to be loved. Which is where, actually, we're going to end. Remember a friend who owned this, the woman with a dirtbag husband? There's a reason the Royal College of Surgeons has this prosthesis. We don't know who she was, but we do know that her rotten husband died, likely of syphilis. She met someone else, they fell in love, they got married, upon which she returned this to the Royal College of Surgeons, and when they asked her why she was returning it, she said it was because her new partner loved her just the way she was. And so, I would like to give a toast. It's the power of solidarity. Whether it's treating your loved ones with respect, forming a club, or making medical masks with your housemates in your living room. Don't let the assholes get you down, because you are not alone. Cheers.